Okay, so um, I think I did in, try to um, kind of uh, put some extra information, but I don't think it's accepted yet. So maybe I will switch between this and the book chapter um, mm -hmm. that I have highlighted and then begin discuss uh, going along the way. Um, if there are any questions or if like I didn't understand some concepts, so I'll just take some help to do that. Um, so I think uh, basically uh, this, uh, so we'll begin with chapter three, linear regression and some of the learning objectives that have been highlighted in this book uh, were performing linear regression with just a single predictor variable and understanding uh, just the simple approach for one, um, one of the useful tools for predicting this response. And then how do you estimate the standard error of regression coefficients and evaluate um, the goodness of the fit of the regression line, perform linear regression with multiple predictor variables. So I'm not sure if um, we'll be doing that today, um, but uh, other of the uh, some other objectives were evaluating the importance of the variables, interaction effects or synergy effects, as it's mentioned in the book, as it's called in market research, and then um, also modeling nonlinear relationships and the nonlinearity in the data set. So these are like the overall objectives of the linear regression, and uh, I'll be presenting just the simple linear regression for today. Yeah. Um, so. Hmm. So some of the questions that uh, linear regression might answer uh, would be related to just the, is there a relationship between the budget and the sales as, and if there is a relationship, what's the evidence of this association between the expenditure and the sales? Then another question could be, how strong is the relationship between the advertising budget and the sales? So what is the strength of, if there is a relationship, then what is the strength of this relationship? And another question could be, which media is associated with sales? So we saw in chapter two that, were, that there were, um, with this graph, that there were three media, uh, specifically TV, radio, and newspaper. And, um, which were associated with the sales. And so uh, is it just one that is associated? Uh, is it two? Is it uh, which one has more strength? So basically to answer this question and to separate the individual contribution by TV, uh, radio, or newspaper, and also together, which would be, I think, in multiple regression. And so how large is the association? Um, and how accurately can we predict the sales is some of the other questions that linear regression might answer. And then is the relationship linear? So if there is approximately a straight line relationship between the advertising expenditure in the various media sales, and then is linear regression the appropriate tool? Or um, if not, then how can we transform the predictors or the response so that linear regression can be used? And uh, lastly, as I said, the one of the objectives would also regarding the interaction effect. So in, I think, marketing terms, it's called the synergy effect. So if you, we are spending a particular amount on television advertising and some amount on radio advertising, then how is it associated with the sales um, for these individual effects and together? So what's the interaction effect between uh, spending on the advertising and the sales. And so in statistics, this is called the interaction effect. So simple linear regression uh, kind of is a straightforward approach to predicting the response Y on predictor X. And um, this uh, Y and X, they are known by several names and I have uh, made a note of this. So Y can also be known as the dependent variable, the response variable, measured variable, um, or the predicted value. And X is also known as the regressor, 
the independent variable, sometimes the explanatory variable, input variable, and the predictor. Um, so here in this uh, particular equation, we can see that um, how the, quant the response, the quantitative response y can uh, be based on a single predictor variable x, which is the simple linear regression, and assuming that there is a linear relationship between x and y. So it can be read as approximately it is modeled by uh, this particular symbol. So it assumes that there is an approximate linear relationship between x and y. And this is just a mathematical notation of how it can be written. So um, an example from chapter two might be that x uh, represents advertising and y represents sales. Um, so it's like how can, another way to say it is that we can regress the sales onto uh, the advertising by TV uh, or radio, whichever um, predictor we are thinking about and the response variable and then uh, fitting this particular model using this equation. So here the beta naught is known as the uh, intercept and the beta one is the slope. Uh, and both of them are unknown constants. Um, so since they are unknown, uh, they are also known as coefficients or parameters. And uh, we use train, training data set or uh, sample data set to kind of uh, try to approximate, get an approximation of the intercept and the slope. Um, and so the beta naught hat, the hat symbol uh, typically denotes that it is an estimation value. So it, we can also think of it in terms of this particular equation being for the whole population. And this is being for the sample. So we are using the sample to make predictions about the population. So, and just correct me if you think I'm going wrong anywhere or if you want to add something. So beta naught is the approximation of intercept and beta one is the approximation of slope. And uh, this is the sample, as I said, um, of the population. And then this is the prediction of y from this x. So uh, it's linear regression is also a simple approach to supervised learning. So if you remember in the first chapter, we did supervised and unsupervised learning. And I think this is an example of supervised learning. So here, uh, what is happening is this is uh, this is the graph that we found. Uh, I think I'll go first with the residual sum of squares. Yeah. So uh, how do we estimate the beta naught and the beta one? So that's the question. So then, uh, if we have a couple of observations, a number of observations from the sample size, uh, we use that to be predicting this particular equation, and so. The graph that is shown here uh, basically tells us that there are a lot, like we see a lot of these observations and this blue line is the line of best fit. So here we see that the fit is found basically by when we minimize the res residual sum of squares. And so the residual sum of squares can also be known as, it's basically the least squares or the OLS method, as we call it for linear regression. And so each of these red dots that we see is the predicted value and the gray line uh, that we see represents the residual. And so basically the linear fit is capturing this entire relationship of these predicted, like these dots, the red dots that we are getting here. And it is estimating the trend of the relationship between the TV and the sales. So here we can see that this uh, beta naught is the intercept, which is around approximately six or seven. And then the slope is just uh, the proportion of this line and of the sales and the television advertising. So um, here, uh, the residual sum of squares is represented um, with this particular mathematical equation. 
and um, it the residual can be thought of as the discrepancy between the actual outcome and the predicted outcome. You're minimizing the squares. Okay, yeah, um, that's right. So that's what it says that it's the residual is the discrepancy between the actual and the predicted outcome. And so the residual sum of squares is represented by the squares of these errors. So the X and the Y here are sample means. So as I said, we use the sample and may basically maybe the trained data set. Um, and uh, each residual uh, that we see is basically the distance of the point from the line. And that line can be the line of best fit. And the total square distance of all points have to ideally be really small. So here we see that uh, we are using different uh, beta naught and beta one values on the X and Y axis. And so um, we are trying to minimize the error as much as possible uh, in this graph here, where we see the red dot. So that is basically corresponding to the least squares estimates of beta naught and beta one, the slope and the intercept. Uh, yeah. So uh, next is the... Um, sorry, I have a question. Yeah. Maybe it's beta. Yeah, I'm just wondering, just I'm looking for intuition why this is called least square method. I can see some answers, but I'm happy if one can talk, maybe I can understand better. Yeah, I think that's, uh, once again, let me go to the, I think it's this one. Yeah, I think, I think it's the least squares, least squares is I, it's, I think it's because we want to minimize the RSS, but that's why we square the residual error also because we don't want them to be negative um, in the particular equation that was mentioned there, but I'm not really sure why it is called the least squares method. If anyone else. Uh... Yeah, I think just uh, because we're when you know, you're for, for that given equation, you're finding beta coefficients that uh, have the, the smallest possible uh, residual sum of squares, or it's the least to so the least of that value for, for so the equation you've chosen. Yeah. So min basically minimizing the, so if you see here, it's minimizing the. Mm -hmm residual sum of squares and that and that equation there for for a single regret simple linear regression will give you that that um the value beta coefficient that minimizes that uh sum of uh, residuals sum of squares. okay gotcha i get i get the intuition now i get i think mm -hmm. i got it mm -hmm. thank yeah. you yeah sure yeah mm -hmm. thank you <laughs> Um, so, okay, so this is the visualization of the fit. And then, um, so the next is how do we assess the accuracy of the coefficient estimates? Um, and that is by the um, residual standard errors. So I think RSS, I would think of it, and correct me if I'm wrong, RSS, I would think of it as uh, being related to the line, like how do we make the best fit of the line? And I think um, residual standard errors, I would um, think of it in, in, relate in relation to the slope and the intercept specifically. So if suppose uh, we have to assess the accuracy of these coefficients, then if the slope is zero, um, then there's no relationship between X and Y. Uh, so I would think of it um, in those terms. So the uh, so we want to basically determine uh, what's the precision of these estimates uh, of our slope and the intercept. And while determining the precision, this uh, we want to see what is the error of the slope and the intercept. And so the residual standard error uh, is given by this equation. And here we see that um, the sigma squared 
um, this sigma squared in both the slope and the intercept, the standard error of the slope and the intercept is um, the noise or the variance of the errors. So here we can see it's basically this noise or the variance. And then the um, this particular x i minus the bar x is the spread of x's around. So we can think of it more like uh, if we go back here. So the sigma squared will be the this noise around this line. And the x uh, can be the spread, can be the spread of these values of television. Uh, so if we have all these points, um, for example, if you have all these points located in just between 50 and 100, if they're all clumped in between here, it will be uh, really difficult to have this line of best fit and uh, kind of, um, it will be less precise. The slope is going to be less precise. So when we are assessing the accuracy of the coefficient estimates, uh, we are thinking of the noise, uh, that the more the noise is there around the line, the less is the pre precision of the line of best fit or uh, the less precision of the slope. And the more is the spread of the X values or the TV advertising that we saw, the values on the X axis, the more precise uh, the slope is going to be. Um, and so the 95% confidence intervals is basically the, uh, different range of values uh, such that they, there is a 95% probability that the range will contain the true unknown value um, of the parameter or the unknown constants. And so by this, it means that if repeatedly the samples, if there are 100 samples that are taken and the confidence intervals is constructed for each of the samples, 95% of the times uh, the interval will contain the true known uh, value of the uh, these parameters of the coefficient and the slope. Um, so I, if I don't know if you have any questions or any comments. Yeah, I actually uh, just a comment. I hadn't really seen this equation before um, for the standard error of the beta coefficients, and um, I guess I had always thought of like standard errors with like this, I, like obviously, yeah, this like residual variance, right? And then, mm -hmm. and then the number of samples that you have. But I actually had never realized that a big part of this as well is like you were saying the uh, spread of the of the um, um, kind of the range and the distribution of those values along the predictor. Mm -hmm. um, I did. I had never. I think it's kind of neat and. It took me a little bit. I was like thinking about it and intuitively, kind of what that means. But um, but I think it makes sense. Like that mm -hmm. that the more variation you have, or the more um, kind of uh, yeah, the more variation you have in your predictor values, the the I guess the the more I don't know. Like I, I'm trying to make a statement there, and I'm not like. Uh, having trouble making that statement like um like yeah i don't I, like yeah i don't know like uh i don't know yeah maybe someone else can take it, but, <laughs> no like, i think i am also i also got i have also never like kind of um i mean i have seen it but like intuitively it doesn't make sense so when i was reading about it i thought and correct me if I'm wrong, I thought that this particular, the residual sum of squares, I kind of associated more with the, um, this particular value of residual sum of squares, more with the line and the residual um, standard error, more with the slope and the coefficient itself. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, um, I guess I'm just trying to like yeah, build intuition as to why if you have uh, a wider range of values relative to the mean of the predictor, mm -hmm. why that lessens your standard error of the coefficient and the slope estimates, you know.
I mean, I know it does because looking at the formula, but yes, uh, yeah, but like, but like from like a, I guess some of these things are it's sometimes hard to like explain it in like a, a like a com like a more of a common sense type of way, but um, I mean, it makes sense looking at the formula why it does, but I just mm -hmm. uh, what do you mean lessens it? So, so in that equation, if you have um, values that are further from the mean in the predictor in X, then then the denominator grows. No, oh, but the numerator grows too. Yeah, but um, but I think that's growing faster. I don't know. They they mentioned in the book that um, like they brought up this point. Um, oh, they did. I didn't remember. Yeah, that. I think. Let me look at it on because um, I think it's growing. It's growing. Uh, let's see. I guess it could grow faster than the numerator if, if it's like more than double the mean or something. I don't. Let me look at the book again. Um, here. Maybe I'll try to find that section, but. Um, I can, maybe I can share the book over here. Because I don't think in this, um, in this particular book, uh, my notes are added, so. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm going through the PDF. Uh, hold on yeah, maybe finding the actual text would help. Um, let's see. Oh, right. That They don't mean spread off on the line. They mean, yes, I see now. It's because you have more leverage, how they say in the book. I mean, mean, yeah. X minus X bar is the distance from the line, which is not the case. It's the distance from the mean. So yeah, yeah, yeah. that does make sense. That's all, the, that's all in the predictor. Yeah. Yeah. OK, yeah. now I get it. Yeah, I was confused by that very much. So <laughs> thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so here, can I share my screen really quickly? Um, yes. I have, I have the section up uh, it's here. Yeah, so they're saying, uh, notice that in formula, the standard error of beta one is estimate is, uh, oh, okay. So it's actually just this one here. So you're right that these kind of grow together, right? Um, I was only looking at beta one too. Yeah, 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 yeah. So beta one uh, makes sense. So that's the one so, you could. <laughs> right. So it says smaller when 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 they're more spread out, we have more leverage to estimate slope. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess like, I don't know, I'm still having trouble like um, explaining it beyond that. Like, what does leverage mean? You know, standard and more spread out. Like no, I, guess I think that, because like, maybe we have, yeah, sorry. In the, no, I was, what I was thinking was, Kevin, along the same lines of what you said, uh, leverage, I, I would think is just more absolute distance, right? So the magnitude of the values is larger, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as opposed to say that you had dots clustered all almost in a vertical line. Mm -hmm. There is almost no way to estimate like if it's a rise over run, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, oh, I yeah. Think I, how would you fit the line to like, a, unless you get a vertical line, but that doesn't make any sense. Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. Like if it's more spread out in magnitude, as you said, right. or more values, then um, we would actually also know the slope, right? Like that's the, that's the point here, that the slope would be, we'd be able to tell the slope if, as compared to if it's restricted to certain points, specific points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mm -hmm. At least that, yeah. that's how I'm interpreting. Because, you know, the distance is squared, so it doesn't matter, like, if it's positive or negative. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense, Sandra. I think you nailed it on that. Because, yeah, for sure, that if you have points that are further out, then you'll have much more chance to see a more significant rise, like, because you're further out on the X. So the Ys will be much more. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, there's that's no... A leverage. You're holding a bar further from the end, so you get more leverage to lift up something, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, like, the shovel. so, like, with very little variation in the predictor you have no chance of 
deter finding a relationship between that and an outcome because the predictor isn't varying at all. Um, is that another way to say it too? Yes, yeah. I, I like, think so. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Because you want a unit change of something or some change, right? Mm -hmm. Hopefully larger over a unit change of the, you know, on, on the horizontal. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think that that was a, a super great, I guess I just almost never do simple regression with just one predictor. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh yeah, that's true. Because normally, right, if you have several, like if you're looking at males versus females, say on some sort of treatment, then within your group, like males and females, you want it to be the least variable as possible, right? But the reason is because you're comparing males to females or two different things. And so that's sort of like the basic thing that I usually do and think about, but I just had never thought about like, well, what are these relationships means in terms of just one predictor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, th that was really cool. Actually, thank you for bringing this up. Yeah, it was really helpful because the I think the three the 3D diagram was also like kind of confusing me. Uh, not this one, but um, yeah. um, I was uh, like diff for different values of beta naught and beta one. Like having the least uh, like the RSS specifically was something that I was getting uh, was not intuitive to me when I was reading it, and I also checked like their uh, how they were discussing it in their edX scores and I could not really um, think of it uh, in a very intuitive sense. So I kind of related that um, residual sum of squares to something about the line of best fit, but I'm not sure if um, that's the right way to think about it. No, I think that you're right. Yeah, the residual sum of squares is all about like the line of, so it's sort of like um, in the plot, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where you have all of the red dots um, what you want to minimize with your line of best fit are all of those black lines from the red dots to the line, right? So say that you had a model that is just outside of all of the data points. Mm -hmm. so those black lines would be really, really long, right? Which means that, that those residual sum of scores would be really, really high. So say that this blue line was way down at the bottom, right? Yeah. So this Every would be... residual would be super, super long. Like yeah. Line, yeah. The gray line. Yes, mm -hmm. the gray lines, yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah, so that makes sense. Uh, okay, so um, I'll share. So Sorry I for think- Sidetracking your presentation. Yes. <laughs> no, no, I think it's, uh, I think it was great because I was also having um, some trouble understanding uh, that specifically because I have used, most often I have used multiple regression too, but yeah. in the ed education research, not marketing. So their marketing references were really confusing me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <Same here. laughs> so, um, so I think I will maybe uh, share my screen because uh, I don't think my, I just added all my edits and I don't think that's uh, added to, to this book yet. Is it okay, Kevin, if I share the book itself? Oh yeah, go, yeah, whatever you think is best. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I don't finish. I don't know if you can share. Oh, sorry. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see the book. Uh, when you just when you just shared a second ago. Yeah. No, it's gone. Yeah, it's gone now. So. Okay. Okay. Now you can see it. Yep. Yeah, PDF. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh. So I kind of marked it in here, what all I added to the annotated book. Um, so yeah, so we were basically here having like, we talked about having more leverage to estimate the slope um, and the 95% confidence intervals. So um, the, the standard errors can uh, also be used to perform the hypothesis tests. So 
the null hypothesis is when there's no relationship between X and Y. So we can also think of it in terms of when we see in this, um, in this particular equation where beta one, then B is zero, there is no relationship between uh, Y and X. Um, so H, H naught or the null hypothesis will be no relationship between X and Y versus the alternative hypothesis, which will be when there is some relationship and beta one is not equivalent to zero. Um, so if the standard error of beta one is small, then um, even relatively small values of beta one may provide strong evidence that beta one is less than zero and that there is a relationship between X and Y. So this is some, this is, this was a line which I was kind of struggling with while I was trying to understand. Uh, so it was really easy to understand that X, uh, when beta one is zero, then X is not associated with Y. And um, we kind of need to understand or uh, examine whether our estimate of beta one um, is, different from zero or not. And I think that's also where our confidence interval comes in. Uh, when it contains zero, then uh, it's basically the null hypothesis. If we are kind of rejecting our alternative hypothesis. So this particular, uh, regarding the standard error, I was, um, I was a little um, unsure of how this accuracy of beta one hat or the estimation of the, slope depends on the standard error. Um, and if someone has a better understanding of how it would be associated with that. Um, like why would the standard, if the standard error of this estimation is small, um, how would it provide an evidence that beta one is not equal, not equivalent to zero? Uh, from a like intuitive standpoint, or from, mm -hmm. yes, uh, from the formula. Okay, no, not from the formula. Okay. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, yeah. I mean, I think like the standard error is capturing the so it's capturing as we were just saying the the residual the residual the variance in the residuals right um, mm -hmm. the um, the kind of also the the amount of data you have, right? Like okay. the, the sample size. Okay. Um, and so, so it's, yeah, I mean, it's looking at like your model and saying like how, how like, uh, yeah, like how noisy are the errors in the, that you're making in this model and these predictions. Mm -hmm. um, and then using that information to make a statement about uncertainty of the coefficients that you estimated um like to it's using like basically it's like kind of standardizing your your coefficient estimates mm -hmm. yeah you're standardizing your or kind of normalizing your coefficient estimate by mm -hmm. the standard amount of error that you would expect for those coefficient estimates um yeah okay I don't know if that helps at all, but um, that's how I was thinking about it. Yeah, I'm just <laughs> reflecting. Um, Sorry, what was the equation for the standard error, the SE for B, B1? This. Like, where is this? It's here. No, this is for the oh, estimate. But yeah, this is what they're saying. Mm -hmm. That right. the standard error for standard the beta error one is associated with the coefficient, right? Okay. Yeah. And Yes, this standard error associated with the estimate because it's the beta one hat needs to be small um, and it might provide evidence for. So this was one thing that, um, so uh, basically the T statistics, uh, which most often we use uh, for significance testing is um, if the standard error of uh, beta one hat is large, um, then in an absolute value, then for our, it will help us to not help us, I would say it would give us an evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Um, and so that is how we compute the T statistics, which measures um, the standard deviation that, uh, that the beta one hat is away 
from zero, the number of standard deviations that the beta one hat is away from zero, okay. So, um, and uh, if there is no relationship between X and Y, then um, we expect that the T distribution, and okay, interesting, um, would have N minus two degrees of freedom. So I think degrees of freedom is also one thing that I really struggle with, like the degree freedom, degrees of freedom of the researcher plus the degrees of freedom in the equation is something that I have been um, confused about or struggling to understand, um, like why sample minus two degrees of freedom. Um, so, yeah. Um, so I'm sorry, Parnika, but does anyone have like, this degrees of freedom, I know it's about the flexibility, right, of mm -hmm. the model, as we saw in the previous one, but it also depends, right, on the number of observations. So how is this, like, usually calculated, and what does it mean, like, in a, I, I feel like I've never gotten, like, a full-on explanation of what exactly this means or what it does. Yeah, I think it's the same for me. So I cannot uh, kind of explain the degrees of freedom that comes from the model versus that and the sample size and everything versus the degrees of freedom of the researcher like um yeah 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 i hadn't even heard of the degrees of freedom of the researcher yeah yeah that i mean <laughs> so i don't know if uh, yeah anyone has an idea well i mean i don't have a super good intuition about it, but I, it comes out of the math but one way to think about it is that you know, the degrees of freedom is like how much wiggle room there is left. So mm -hmm. if you have like n data points and you fit a line, you've, you've reduced two of those degrees of freedom. I imagine if you fit like a super high polynomial with exactly n coefficients, you have no degrees of freedom left at all. And clearly you'd have, you fit through all the, all the points, right? So in that case, you'd be dividing by zero. You, you know what I'm saying? So it's like- so, No, I, I didn't get the point about the polynomial degrees of freedom that you were trying to make. Well, I'm just thinking if you fit something higher with, so a linear thing, you subtract two, you have n minus two for a linear fifth because there's two. Two, yes. Parameters, right? Yeah, so parameters. You fit like a n degree or m degree polynomial, you have n minus m degrees of mm -hmm. freedom. If you add more, you lose uh, more degrees of freedom, which affects the uh, calculation of your, of everything, right? Standard error and everything. But, um, that's what that's what they're suggesting there. So normally, when n is much much, when there's a lot of degrees of freedom, you can just ignore the ignore this and treat it like it's a Gaussian distribution of mm -hmm. parameters. Okay. There, but otherwise you have to use that other distribution. What is it called? The t distribution or something like that? So t distribution. Them? Yeah. With n minus two degrees of freedom, or in that case. So. Yeah. Hmm. The, the point in is the normal distribution is, or. Oh, the, the one t, the t distribution. Dist no. The t distribution comes like more like a normal distribution with a yeah, large okay. number of degrees of freedom. Right? Okay. okay. Yeah, that makes it's sense. got big tails on it. Otherwise. Yeah, the tails. Okay. I, I was confusing it with the one tailed and two tailed tests, but okay, I get it. So, it's high tailed compared to the Gaussian, meaning, um, mm -hmm. you know how the tails are where you estimate the p value? So if they're higher, yes. right, your p value mm -hmm. to be larger for, I guess, lower values of n. So for less observations, is that right? I mean, I, don't listen to me. Maybe I'm confusing that. Yeah. Maybe yeah. That's the way about it. <laughs> and n here is the number of observations. So. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So they're saying has a bell shape and for values of n greater than approximately 30, it is quite similar to the standard normal distribution. Yeah, maybe this is the central tendency theorem that they're talking about. I mean, I'll, I'll post this in the chat, the Wikipedia article for the T distribution. You actually can see how the distribution changes with the number of degrees of freedom. Ooh, okay. 30 is about the right number when it starts to look really Gaussian. Yeah, and is this also, uh, can this also, the students see distribution, yeah, okay. Is this also related to this particular line also to the central tendency theorem that like after 30 observations, we do not, um, not do not, but kind of, um, 
like the different assumptions we have for this particular like the the OLS um, they don't really actually matter after 30 observations like I don't know if you know like what I'm talking about the central limit theory we're talking about central limit theorem <laughs> yeah I'm sorry like presenting is a little making me a little nervous yes the central limit theorem so I think is this um, yeah yeah so this is not the central limit theorem they are talking about here. It's just the T distribution. I, I think the central, central limit theorem is important. Theorem. Yeah, go, go ahead, Ron. Sorry. I say the central limit theorem is also important because the approximation of whatever the real distribution of this thing is by a normal distribution. I mean, the T distribution, yes. probably with a small number of observations, the T distribution is probably not right either. <laughs> so. <laughs> right. Yes. Right. Yes. And that's where the, that's when we have to take into account the assumptions of the OLS regression yeah. seriously. Right. Yeah. Because it's not the, yeah, the mean is not zero and the standard. Okay. Okay. You guys remind me, but is the um, central limit theorem, theorem says that as N gets larger, mm -hmm. then your sample distribution gets closer to the population distribution, to the true population. Yes, I think okay. it's that. But okay. I can. Well, that um, I guess that would make sense. Yeah. 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 yeah so basically, taking larger, uh, ran randomly taking large samples from the population, uh, mm -hmm. then the distribution of the um, sample means is get, keeps getting closer. Like it will be approximately normally distributed. Right. And right, closer right. to the pop. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so looking at the derivation of this T distribution thing, I don't want to dwell on it too much, but you can see where in the derivation, the Wikipedia page, they actually assume that the variables X, you know, that they're taking the mean of here is are independently and normally distributed, right? Which is probably mm -hmm. not the case. But as you get to large N, not only does the T distribution become normal, but also you can, that assumption becomes better too. So the whole mm -hmm. thing it holds together better with more samples. <laughs> Right, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay. Then. That's how I would say it. I don't know if that's exactly correct, but that's how I think about it anyway. Wow. Yeah, I think I lo I'm learning more, more from presenting in the book club than I learned from listening. <laughs> so, okay, thank you. No, I always say you learn, you learn more by teaching. Than yes, I agree. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah, that was, uh, that was really helpful. Um, so, um, Okay, where, where were we? So the T, yeah, the T distribution has uh, a bell shape and for values of N greater than approximately 30, it is similar to the standard normal distribution as uh, you were talking about right now. So basically we are interpreting the P values as a uh, small P value is unlikely to observe a substance, substantial association between the predictor and the response due to chance in the absence of any real association between the predictor and the response. I think I, when I was reading this and uh, thinking about T statistics, it's also like, uh, I think both of them are related. As the T statistics becomes larger, the P value gets smaller. Um, and what I heard in the edX is significance, but I think what they were also talking about is, um, the effect size um, is related to that. Um, and so that was something that was really interesting. And I learned um, in, the th um, in the video about the smaller the p-value and how the larger is the t statistics. Um, so here uh, in this graph, this is, I think, um, the first example from what we discussed today more uh, overall about linear regression. And so here we can see um, the intercept uh, and the for the advertising data, the coefficients, and so the intercept and the TV, and here we see the coefficient, the standard error that we talked about, T statistics, and the p-value. So uh, for every increase, like we talked about a unit increase um, and in X and uh, how it's related. Um, so for an increase of $1,000 in this advertising budget in the TV here, um, how it, it's it's associated with an increase in sales with around 40, approximately like 47 units of sale, which is here the coefficient. And um, so this is um, 
basically what we, I think, talked about today in linear regression and what I was talking about regarding p-value and t-statistics was this, like um, this, as this is a large t-statistic, like greater than two. And so uh, we can see that the p-value is uh, really low. But um, yeah, but I would be interested to see what you think about effect size in this particular sense. Um, because I know there is a lot of um, like literature that talks about not correlating lower p-values with a higher effect size, like p-value is just a threshold. Um, and so I would be interested in what you think about it. I would think of t statistic closer to the effect size than the value of p, but um, yeah. If you have so any... How is the um, effect size computed? Yeah. yeah. I've heard a lot about effect size, but I've never, I guess, really taken a look at it. I, I you know, I sometimes we, mostly look at p-values so i think if you look yeah. at i think it's like the the mean yeah. difference so if you look at the difference in the means between mm -hmm. like two groups mm -hmm. then it's it's that difference divided by the pooled standard errors of the two groups uh yeah uh, so it's like a average it's like kind of averaging the standard errors between the two groups and then uh, on in, in the denominator um, and dividing the mean difference by that value. Um, so it's like kind of like a standardized mean difference mm -hmm. yes. between groups. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, but that we can also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I would think of effect size like that in terms of ANOVA, but. ANOVA and um, the tests, I think that would be the, uh, when we talk about the standardized uh, mean difference, that would be the Cohen's effect size, but we can also think of it in terms of correlation and uh, between the variables. Um, that is the R square statistics, right? Like whether um, the R is strong or moderate, I think the correlation between the two variables can also determine the effect size of the relationship. Oh, like little r squared, the Pearson? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think, uh, yes. And I think the regression coefficient can also, the re yeah, the regression, co so I think, um, yeah, I think what uh, Kevin said was uh, like the definition of effect size, but I think yeah, in general, Cohen's D, you're right. yes, Cohen's D. I think that's the main definition of the effect size, but I think it can be mm -hmm. depending on the test that we use or depending on the answer that we are trying to find about the predictor explanatory variable and the response. Uh, I think it also um, depends. Um, so, okay. mm -hmm. yeah. so mathematically, does this Cohen's D relate to calculations of the, either the T statistic or the P value or no? No, okay. I don't think it's related to the P value at all, but I have heard Got a it. lot. Yeah. And maybe I, yeah, I don't think it is. It's not related to the P value. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, no, that makes sense. So I think intuitively for, um, at least for me, you know, um, when I've thought about this, the effect size just means maybe for you guys, I don't know if you work in you know, whatever field you work in, but for example, right, um, if you are measuring, I don't know, lifespan change in an organism, right, and you have a super, super significant difference between two groups, like maybe on mice, right, where you've given one mm -hmm. a drug, um, and the drug has a super significant effect on longevity in the mice, but the mice are living two weeks more than the other group. So the effect size there is mm -hmm. almost irrelevant. You know what I mean? Even though the results are significant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I was, uh, yeah, I got confused there because you said super, super significant. So I'm like, are you going yeah. towards effect size? Because I think even super, super significant would not, Relate, to, but yeah, exactly. I, I so know. the difference between groups could be a p value of you know p to the minus 15, right? Yes. But if it's only two weeks, then you got to interpret that in terms of you know the effect size almost doesn't make sense in that case for, for this, drug. Makes, yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I think that makes sense. Well, okay, um, 
this is interesting <laughs> <laughs> so um so yeah that i think this was a interesting conversation between t statistic p value and the effect size uh so we uh, next uh, it's based how we reject the null hypothesis um to declare that the relationship does not exist between x and y if the p value is small enough so um we know that the typical cutoffs are five percent and one percent and we have also discussed about the central limit theorem um so i think um i think we did discuss the accuracy of the model or the residual standard error um i don't know if uh, yeah yeah i think i had yeah we have already discussed the residual standard error um yeah i uh, i think i'll stop here because i had just prepared till here so i don't know if we have any other questions or we want to discuss anything I was going to say, I like how they, um, when they talk about the R squared uh, statistic, I like how they talk about it in terms of, uh, sorry, in terms of um, responding the, yeah, the residual, the, sorry, the RSS, what, I, I keep on forgetting what that stands for, uh, the residual sum of squares. Sum of right? squares, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, total sum of squares residual sum of squares and yeah total sum of squares I, I just liked how they characterized it like I, I like how they're like building these little kind of chunks about like uh you know talking about standard errors residual sum of squares total sum of squares and then and then they like kind of bring it all together and like compose it in a certain way and and, and use it to explain r squared use it to explain standard errors like I, I feel like they're going to do a good job of establishing those components and then like kind of you know they all go into each of these different statistics you know and I, I like how they they've done that um like it's a I think they're the conceptual links there I think are really helpful at least for me yeah I think I I agree with you and I think like discussing here like what it means intuitively I think makes uh, better sense for me um because then like i don't have to be stressed about the mathematical equations but i can also like understand what is like the concept behind it so i agree with how they are building that up in this book that's that's really interesting um it does so it does also make me want to at some point go to elements of statistical learning um the more kind of math heavy or mm -hmm. uh, a, a technical version or somewhat of a version of this and and like look at all these different um derivations and stuff and try to understand it because like i don't know it makes me sad every time i read about this stuff because like i took like calculus and linear algebra in college but mm -hmm. it was not in an applied context and it was like so unclear how it was useful and then you see this stuff and you're like oh this is you know you know minimizing this value it's calculus like and yeah. then they were like oh well and then if you do in the multiple regression context, this is, it's actually just a lot of matrix algebra. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm like, I wish I had seen, learned about those connections when I was learning that math. Um, Cause I think it would, yeah, it would, it would make this make more sense as well. Right. Uh, at least the first time I learned it. Um, but it makes me want to go to that book. I know Ron, you posted a, I think a, a sample from elements of statistical learning like last week. Um, but uh, yeah, it just makes me want to go into the go in there and really get uh, kind of go into the details of those steps there. Um. Yeah, I I agree. Although I have not taken linear algebra, but I think um, specifically in terms of R and uh, multiple reg regression, I do feel that to know actually what's going on behind this. Like even here when I was reading it. Um, like just understanding this total sum of squares and the total variance in response y, I was like every uh, equation that I see, I'm more inclined to learn what's going behind that equation or how is mm -hmm. it derived. Yeah, yeah. And like, uh, sorry, the other thing I'll say is that um, 
it's also kind of elegant to see that or, and also understand the difference with like something like linear regression there's an equation at least for the simple right for the simple linear regression and as well as multiple linear regression there's an equation a known equation to minimize that uh sum of squares right um like in a lot of the methods that i think we're going to talk about later there's a lot of like sampling procedures involved and things like that where you're doing resampling you're like estimating from those resamples and like in this case it's just like an exact equation it's like it's like yeah. this is the value of this coefficient given the structure of this equation and like this is it this is going to minimize it um and i just to me that difference is like kind of striking like it's like it's going to give you that that value each time you estimate it <laughs> like um and in a lot of other methods that's not true you know you you estimate five times and you're going to get five slightly different estimates um interesting and this is in the resampling uh chapter just say, no i'm just saying like there are some methods that use okay. resampling within their method within the kind of algorithm um and okay. um like like a lot of the tree-based methods do that um and um yeah it just is it's interesting that like it's just like you know beta one is, is just the value that you get from plugging everything into this formula that, mm -hmm. that was derived from calculus like um it's just uh yeah i don't know I, one thing that i think is useful you triggered my memory of this because we're talking about resampling but like in terms of this uh, linear regression the errors on the coefficients right i mean it's like that formula they just they just throw it at you and you're mm -hmm. like okay i guess that's it because you know um, I'll just have to take their word for it, but you don't really have to, you could go into the other book and learn the derivation, or you could do this other thing, which I think is fun. I've done it. And I think it's a great way to learn these things is that is take a line, right? Take any, you know, model you want, a line, linear model and just simulate data, you know, just like take mm -hmm. points, better, and calculate why, and then add some noise to it and then fit it, mm -hmm. right? Fit data and see what kind of slope you get. Then do this over and over and over again. You get a whole range of slopes and there'll be a nice little bell distribution of slopes you get. And it'll be the center will be the mean and the distribution will be uh the width will be the standard error of that slope right oh that's yeah make some fake model. data fit it you yeah. know and then do that yeah. over and over again to see what range of results you get from your fits yeah yeah just build true intuition of what's going on that's something yeah. i can learn from the statistical rethinking book that bayesian mm -hmm. book is it, mm -hmm. it does that a lot mm -hmm. yeah um I think what you just said also made me think about what I was saying a second ago more like I think what some of some of what I was getting at was like that the there's no uncertainty in like the fitting process in linear regression like like it just you get you get it right. so you have a certain yeah yeah but like it, but like the uncertainty is in the other things like the bias of you know the, is the functional form right is uh the sample the resampling like kind of sample to sample what kinds of variants you're going to get sample to sample so yeah. like the uncertainty comes from a different place than some of the other algorithms that that like have uncertainty in the actual estimation you know mm -hmm. um and like i don't know yeah it's just interesting to to like think about those different characteristics of these some of these algorithms um Right, right. But, yeah, that's why I like that simulation approach because it shows it makes the uncertainty more tangible. It's like, okay, I'll just right. make some fake data and I'll regenerate yeah. the data over and over again. And I'll just use the error, the you know, right. the sigma to put error on. Of course, each time my data set will be different. It'll be the same, fit the same line more or less, but it's going to be some uncertainty now in the slope mm -hmm. that I get from doing from, that. from the sample to sample variation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, sample. To sample. You know, I'm talking about super samples. I'm talking about samples of data. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. yeah, yeah. Not the, right. Right. yeah. Different data sets, simulated data sets. That's the way. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Couldn't really do that in real life, probably. Well, you can't. I mean, that's kind of how resampling works, right? It's kind of doing that same thing. Right. Sort of doing that in real life is this resampling methods, right? Yep. Um, I, I know we're uh, at five um, here. We can anyway, hang out yeah, for yeah, a couple minutes if you want to. I have a um, question for next week. So um, next yeah. week we're going over exercises, right? For for the chapter. Um, uh, are we going to finish the rest of the Pranika, I, I know that you covered, you know, whatever was in the in the book down. So, mm -hmm. but are we going over multiple regression and or? Yeah. Okay. I think yeah, we I think should, we, right? Yeah, I think we should. Um, 
Pranika, would you like to continue and uh, do that part? Or yeah, um, yeah, I I think I can do that. It's just uh, I think I would like to. I don't know, Kevin. You tell me if it's mm -hmm. more possible. I think I would rather present like a presentation format than the book down because it takes me mm -hmm. some time to edit the book down and then yeah. push it forward and then have like mm -hmm. today I didn't have a lot of my edits in. Yeah. So yeah. if it's okay for all of you, I would like. I would. Yeah. I'm good with that. I, I give I would give people whatever flexibility they want in, okay. in the actual presentation. Um, I'll also say though that you don't have to have the book down your version of the book down push to the GitHub in order to for you to present. So you can just do all your edits, have it all locally, present the local okay. version, and then and then make those changes later in the actual book down you know what I mean okay okay I didn't so, know that because uh okay I was really I think I wasted more time in the book down that like with the like with the github process yeah. and all of that yeah yeah. Okay. yeah I mean um yeah sorry I I could have should have made that clear like you like that's what some people do I've seen it in some of these book clubs is that they'll present their local version of the book down and then you know you can tinker with it do whatever you want with it and then like after you're done tinkering you can you could push it up um to get up okay. so yeah i think that that's that would have been way better yeah i agree. yeah thank you yeah okay. yeah yeah sure um <laughs> no it's uh um yeah kevin um is there any uh previous sessions um broke down that one can just add up is there anyone yeah yeah we're actually the fourth cohort so there's ah. uh Okay. Three other cohorts of yeah. they they've all contributed to the book down. Yeah. So there's only one book down though, right? We're all using this. There's only one book down. Yeah, only one book down. Yeah. I wasn't sure about that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So then um for next week, then we have Praniga presenting the rest of it. And mm -hmm. so are we also going over exercises or do we leave that for next time? Or how do you um what are you thinking? Uh, so next week we just had so it's multiple regression, yeah, like F statistics. Um and then like assumptions of linear regression, like the kind of when things go wrong section um, okay. and also encoding qualitative predictors. I mean, that seems like a, a decent amount, but yeah. I'd say if we, if we, if, yeah. The thing is like, I know that from our first session, like it seems like a lot of people want to like get this stuff right like get get this down this yep. these, this linear regression and kind of the first set of chapters down well so yeah, yeah. um yes. if that's true if that's right uh that i'm making that into it then maybe we should just focus on the second half of this chapter next week and then do the exercises the week after I don't know. okay that sounds perfect because i i think that the exercises are where i'm going to get stuck and yeah. would definitely like to hear you guys's input um that's also where you actually learn it, right? Like how to apply it. So yeah. perfect. Um, yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. I, I really like yeah. that. Yeah. The guy, okay, I just like, there's a lot of, I feel like foundational stuff and like it, it's, I think it's useful to just um, not, not completely rush through it. Um, exactly. I feel like it's um, sometimes, you know, just to fit a time limit, we do rush through some things and then those don't get solidified as well. Mm -hmm. I'm all for taking a little bit more time. So what's the proposal? Just to, to, to not try to squeeze in the exercises next week and just do the oh. second half of the chapter. Um, like, because then we still have a decent amount of the chapter to do in terms of content. Um, so do you want to just discuss exercises on the, on the Slack then? Is that... We could no, do that we... or we could do it the next session. Um, Let's do it honestly... next session if you guys don't mind. So just push everything a week? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Okay. Okay. Oh. Bye, Sam. Oh, all bye. right. All right. Thank you. Sounds good. I'll, I'll talk to you all next week. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Thank you, Pranika. All right. Bye. Thank bye. you, Pranika. Awesome. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. bye.